Hello. Thank you for joining tonight. And I wanted to welcome everyone and thank you for joining us for today's webinar. My name is Ashley Vitalia, and I'm the Senior Manager of Business Development and Partnerships at the New York Institute of Finance. New York Institute of Finance was founded by the New York Stock Exchange in 1922 and has been training customers all around the world for almost 100 years. We are headquartered in New York and have a local teams in Beijing, Shanghai, Hong Kong, New Delhi, and Jakarta. Today, we are presenting a demonstration of the Young Finance Scholar Program presented by Knife Instructors, Chris Thomas. Chris is a senior lecturer in the areas of asset management in the family office. He's the managing director at Simon Quick, a multifamily office based in Morristown, New Jersey in New York City. Our second presenter today will be Jimmy Pang. Jimmy is Knife senior lecturer in areas of portfolio management and macroeconomics. He is a visiting professor at NYU where he teaches courses in portfolio management and applied equity research. Currently, he's also serving as a managing director, oh, sorry, um, as managing director at Grayson Capital Management and CEO of JKP Consulting LLC, managing high net worth family offices and private equity. And at the end, we will be conducting a Q&A and answering all of your questions with our curriculum director, Jack Farmer. Jack has been a curriculum director for the New York Institute of Finance for over three years. He also acts as an outside advisor for portfolio managers at significant global investment funds. And now we'll go ahead and get started. Please know that if you have any questions, please use the Q&A box feature. We will have a moderator that will be able to share your questions with the panelists and we will answer them at the end of the session. So why don't we go ahead and get started? So over the years, Knife has provided financial guidance to each new generation of private banking clients of large financial institutions, as well as recent college graduates who have received certificate training. Our years of experience tell us that mastering the basic knowledge of finance and business and learning how to review and analyze problems with a financial perspective is similar to teaching a person who doesn't understand music to learn how to play an instrument and appreciate it. As part of our continuing commitment to providing high quality online professional education to learners everywhere, we have developed the Young Finance Scholar Program comprised of 20 courses over the course of four weeks, plus 10 electives of high school for high school and middle school students. So the Young Finance Scholar Program provides an extension of ability and literacy, especially for the youth to gradually integrate into adulthood, improve their own thinking and expand their confidence in communicating with adults. The instructors of Knife, who you'll meet two of them tonight, whose careers are primarily in the financial field, are distinguished from the academic teachers in traditional schools. They are practitioners in the industry and have had extensive experience in their respective fields. We believe with programs like these, young students will have the opportunity to expand their network by interacting with our Knife faculty, observing and networking with our community of professionals in finance and business, in addition to their family members at home and academic teachers and other groups in the school. The New York Institute of Finance has devoted itself for nearly a century to mentoring professionals, and we feel that our knowledge base and teaching expertise are a valuable resource for the long-term development and growth of young people. So due to the pandemic, we have specially designed this program to deli be delivered online for young students, and we hope to give you more options when arranging summer activities for your children this summer. While we're promoting this program in the US, we are also introducing it in other countries. Our plan is to attract students from different countries and cultural backgrounds to participate in this financial summer camp. So now, without further ado, we will begin the demonstration of the Young Finance Scholar Program. During this demonstration, we will briefly cover five topics from the program, starting with knife instructor, Jimmy Peng, who will discuss what is business and how to set up a new company. Please note that this presentation is targeted for a middle school audience. And now I will turn it over to Jimmy. Great, uh, thank you, Ashley. Uh, so let me first uh, share my screen correctly before we begin and some of the beautiful um, slides that we've set up for everybody. Uh, here we go. Uh, so just a little bit, uh, Ashley gave a great uh, introduction 
Uh, but just a little bit uh, more about myself. Um, I've, I've actually been in finance since uh, I was in college. Uh, so I was actually lucky enough to uh, have started and uh, known what I've wanted to do uh, at, a, at a fairly uh, young age. Uh, and the reality is that the younger you start, uh, the better. Uh, I've also been fortunate enough to work at some fairly uh, big firms. Uh, if anybody's uh, in New York and in Midtown, you might have seen uh, the big building, Alliance Bernstein. Uh, so I was at um, AB for a, a number of years and then ultimately ended up in, in Hong Kong with um, a, a big bank called uh, Bank of Communications. Uh, but more importantly for, for everyone in this audience, uh, I also at NYU uh, from high school uh, up to the uh, master's programs. Uh, so ages of, of all across the board uh, from young to uh, advanced. Um, and I think it's great uh, with regard to this program uh, that young adults get an opportunity uh, to participate. Uh, uh, just a, a quick story, uh, you know, I went to Bronx Science and even with Bronx Science, uh, as advanced as it is, they, they don't offer, they haven't offered a business or finance program when I was there. Uh, so uh, hopefully we can make those that can attend this uh, even more fortunate uh, to be able to participate um, and, and uh, you know, create an opportunity, uh, an even greater opportunity uh, in life. Uh, so with that, uh, let me actually give you a, a sample um, of some of the topics, uh, the ideas to give you today a teaser of what you, uh, you know, may learn uh, throughout this program uh, that's sort of customized to certain age groups. And, and the first topic is, is really just very broad, uh, what is a business um, and the initial possible setup uh, of a business. Uh, and you know, business is, I think, everyone sort of knows what it is, but I think the idea is to create a mindset of an everyday approach to life and how you can begin to think deeper of you know when you're going to a grocery store or you're on an app you know i'm sure everyone recognizes these symbols right from facebook to snapchat to youtube or to google but do you really think about the underlying uh mechanics of how they make money you know some of these companies make money off of you um, and you don't know it um, you may go to the grocery store and you're spending money uh, but uh, you know, how does that product end up on the shelf of that grocery store um, and how do they make money? Uh, so I think it's just to, to begin to, to have that kind of mindset of when you go out, that business mindset, uh, because ultimately, you know, the hope is that uh, each and every one of you at some point create your own company, right? Do you always want to work for somebody else? You know, probably not. Uh, ultimately, uh, everybody, um, it's not as hard as you think. Uh, you can create your own company. Um, and here's just sort of a snapshot of how you uh, may begin to understand what business is uh, and um, the steps to perhaps, again, create, to create your own company. Uh, so just some, some questions to think about, right? Uh, part of this is to, to help you brainstorm um, and you know, think about what's the last uh, item that you bought from, from a store. Um, have you ever traded anything you know, from baseball cards? Uh, to comic books, right? This is an actual business for, for many folks, right? When you go to a comic book store. Uh, services, you know, what service have you used? It, it, maybe it's not a product. Uh, you know, Amazon uh, is a service that delivers a product to your doorstep, right? And they make a lot of money. Uh, what are some things that you have that you might trade? You know, <laughs> uh, don't, don't trade your parents sort of antiques and things like that, but certainly uh, you can look through uh, your basement and maybe you have collectibles um, you know, one of the examples that I might use later on uh, is Yu-Gi-Oh cards. So I don't know how old uh, some of you uh, uh, exactly are, but you might have encountered and played this um, game, which I'll uh, have an, as an example later on. Um, you know, what are some funny business opportunities that you've seen, right? People make money off of all sorts of products, right? From pet products. Uh, there are shows such as Shark Tank and The Profit which anybody can watch. And sometimes you do see uh, sort of a teenager uh, pitching their product on some of those shows. Um, the, so the point is, you know, business can be seen from any angle um, and anybody can think of um, a business. Uh, and actually, if you have the willpower um, to create it uh, from buying or selling a good or service, um, as I mentioned about internet data and traffic uh, transactions, you know, these are obviously uh, can be a business when you see shipping goods. Um, and whenever you go to sort of a store, um, I don't know if there are any gamers out there, uh, but one of the examples we may use later on is also uh, a gaming example. 
Um, so let's start at the very basic to just taking a step back, um, right? Many hundreds of years ago, uh, the biggest business was probably just to be a farmer, right? To put food on the table. Uh, so we've, you know, we've evolved since then as human beings uh, and we want to purchase more than uh, just uh, food on the table. Uh, but, you know, this is an actual business and it's still a business, right? Selling soybeans to other countries. You know, America does do that. Uh, we also buy um, uh, products from uh, Latin America uh, to feed ourselves. Uh, so that's certainly a trade or a business. Um, you know, some of you might have a hobby and that certainly can be a business clearly uh, with uh, art projects. Uh, that it's you know not just a hobby. If somebody has uh, a demand for your your beautiful uh, service or good, uh, you can actually you know make uh, what's called a living on that. You know, and that's building a business. Um, and even more so now on social media, uh, you you might see uh, people painting themselves or painting a, a picture, and the number of views, depending on the clicks, can actually make you money. Right? The Facebook likes. Right? That's just not. Uh, um, they don't do that for for uh, no reason. Uh, it's actually to create income, uh, and of course, you know, you see if you go out in in the daily world, you might see somebody with a suit and tie, a man or a woman, and you know they they go to work and and have a profession, uh, be it an accountant uh, or you know stocking shelves uh, at Amazon. Uh, you know, so certainly uh, if you have a passion for something, um, you can begin to create uh, income from that. Um, and you know one of the other great examples now, of course, you know with everybody ordering online and us you know teaching remotely, of course, uh, is ordering something to your home with goods and services, uh, and it's going to go going to become even more sophisticated going forward. Uh, it might not even be delivered by a person, right? It could be a bot um, or um, you know a golf cart that's uh, remote, uh, but certainly this is you know e-commerce, right? You've all heard of e-commerce as uh, a booming business. Um, and anybody could sort of create an online store, really, uh, with a global trade. Uh, so here's a map, um, you know, in terms of this global trade. And that's the beauty of it, right? With respect to uh, folks on this call, you could also be located anywhere in the world and, and looking at this presentation remotely. Uh, but you can build a, a good or a service that it, it, maybe it's just not appealing to uh, folks in America. It could be appealing to folks in Germany. Um, and they can have access uh, to your product. Um, and so the world is your oyster. Um, and the more you understand business and ideas um, and educate yourself, uh, the bigger the opportunity, right? Um, and here's just a flow chart of how international trade uh, can be conducted uh, if you import products bringing into your country and then maybe export, uh, which is goods that's traded um, and demanded outside of your home country. Uh, some of you guys might have heard uh, of a company called Alibaba, right? So that's actually the, the Asia version uh, of Amazon. Uh, so just as a summary, um, you can certainly uh, create products, uh, but, you know, e-commerce uh, is booming. Um, you know, you can make a living from uh, still being a farmer, right? Uh, there's a, a lot of uh, demand for that as well still uh, in terms of, um, you know, farm to table uh, you're bringing uh, an organic chicken or organic uh, meat uh, into your living room to eat. Um, so there's always opportunities abound uh, to create a business. Um, and so it's not as hard as you think, right? So setting up a company, um, some people might think it's, it's, it's extremely complex, but it's actually not. Um, uh, you know, when I was 18, uh, I just, I wrote a, just sort of a, a little booklet on investing in, in markets. Uh, and actually I created a, a sole proprietorship, uh, right? Why did I do that? Because it's actually very easy to set up, just go to the bank, tell them you wanna create it, uh, ask an accountant to sort of register it, and a sole proprietorship, uh, the beauty of it is that it's just yourself. Uh, other setups, if you want to have friends and family involved, which could be a little bit more complicated, right? As you know, you have to get along with your friends. Um, that's when you wanna create a partnership. An LLC, it's called a limited liability company. And then when you wanna create something even bigger, which um, I believe Chris will talk about later on, uh, you may actually uh, create a C-Corp and develop it into a C-Corp where other people um, and more, uh, a greater audience can uh, invest in yourself and your company. Um, so we're not gonna go into, right, we don't have time to go into extraordinarily detail uh, on each of these uh, setups, uh, but 
you know, when you obviously uh, uh, perhaps uh, participate in the course, uh, there's going to be much more detail and explanation of the various terms. Uh, but here's a comparison of a sole proprietorship versus an LLC, a C Corp. And it's not as complex as you think. Uh, just have an accountant. You can even register it yourself with the state. Uh, but you do have to decide in terms of some certain concepts uh, how much control you want. Uh, there are some uh, terms that you might have to understand later on called uh, liquidity, um, taxes, um, and control. Uh, so that'll help you determine which one of these setups uh, you, uh, you uh, can you know, most uh, benefit from. Uh, and then the last, really liability actually is another term uh, is very important in the US. Uh, and that's just a fancy way of saying, if, if something happens, who's gonna take the blame, right? So that's liability, uh, blame, taxes. Those are probably the two most um, important issues uh, when it comes to setting up your own company. Um, and so here's a, a, a very, very easy summary uh, that anybody can understand. Uh, keeping in mind, uh, if you don't wanna start the company yourself, uh, then you might have friends that help you, but here's the key, right? <laughs> you have to be able to get along with your, your friends uh, and your best friends uh, if you're gonna start a company and partnership uh, with them. Uh, and you can see many examples of that um, uh, abound, uh, which we'll talk about uh, later on when we talk about companies. Uh, and so uh, with many of these modules, we'll also have breakout activities. You know, you won't be doing it alone in a sort of a boring lecture. Uh, you'll be able to interact with your peers, um, certainly with guidance uh, from ourselves uh, and your, uh, your uh, teachers. The, the, the last part of this, I'll just uh, end it with just a, a quick quiz, if you will. Um, I don't, you guys don't have to answer at the moment, I'll answer it for you. Uh, but uh, the, the, the interesting thing about companies, it's that very diverse in terms of the founders. Uh, you might have a computer company started by two college dropouts. Uh, you might have a burger company started by a high schooler. Um, and you might have a computer company started from a, a, a person in a dorm room, right? Uh, so that person who started the company, uh, the computer company was uh, Michael Dell at a very young age. Right? And uh, he created a phenomenal uh, company at a very young age. Uh, the high school dropout with the burger joint, if anyone's wondering, was actually Wendy's. Yeah? So uh, those that are thinking about uh, eating uh, burgers, uh, and now you know, you know who founded uh, Wendy's. And uh, the, uh, the last one is actually probably the most popular one, uh, Apple um, with the Macintosh. Uh, right when I was uh, beginning college, uh, that's when uh, they started uh, Apple. And uh, that was Steve Jobs, who's quite famous now. And then the other uh, person who actually uh, made the hardware, right? So there's certain expertise that you might have with your partners where Wozniak was actually the hardware person and Steve Jobs was the salesperson, right? Um, so let me um, sort of finish off there. Uh, we're gonna have uh, case studies uh, a, a little bit later. And some things to think about for yourselves going forward is, right? Uh, and it, it doesn't matter how young you are, you could begin thinking about what type of company, uh, what are things that you're interested in, how can you create a service or a product uh, that other people uh, might enjoy. Right? Uh, so let me uh, change it, move it back to uh, the moderator and uh, we can move on to the next section. Great, thank you so much, Jimmy. I appreciate the breakdown on you know, learning about what a business is and how to set it up. And it seems quite simple, but now we need to start thinking even bigger. How can we support company growth with external capital? So now I invite our other instructor, Chris Thomas, to talk about capital markets. Chris? Ashley, thanks. Jimmy, thanks. So um, as, as Ashley mentioned, we're going to talk about capital markets. And I think Jimmy's lead-in is a great foundational resource for, for building an understanding of capital markets. So when we look at capital markets, I think a lot of people tend to think that these are big, complicated places occupied by um, major corporations, big investment banks, uh, very wealthy families, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The, the reality about capital markets is that everybody everywhere, a younger person, parents, uh, grandparents, uh, corporations, small, large, medium-sized, are all capital markets participants. Um, Simple things like putting money into a checking account, putting money into a savings account, spending money on a credit card, putting money into a retirement account. All these things add up 
to the global capital markets and the trillions and trillions and trillions of dollars that are traded every day. So no matter where you are in the world, everything you do impacts the capital markets in one way, shape, or form. Maybe not as much as Goldman Sachs or Morgan Stanley or Allianz do, but believe you me, everybody everywhere is involved in the capital markets. Simplest transactions are the foundations of the capital markets. And, and as Ashley said, uh, as a segue from what, from what Jimmy was talking about, capital markets are incredibly important to the growth of corporations, um, for corporations to fund themselves. And, and remember, these things just don't benefit CEOs and CFOs and, and, and there's people at the top of companies. Corporations fund themselves in order to pay their workers, to pay their suppliers, the capital markets keep the global economy running. When McDonald's needs to pay the millions of people who work for it around the world, they just don't take it out of, they just don't take it out of profits. They borrow money on a very short-term basis from, from investors and they pay their workers. This is you know, important stuff. It's the lifeblood of the global economy. So while the corporation, as Jimmy said, is kind of the foundation for, for the economy organizationally, the capital markets are what feed corporations the cash they need to keep going. So what else do capital markets do? Capital markets just don't help fund corporations, even though that's one of their primary um, objectives. Capital markets also put together investors, that is people who have, <clears throat> excuse me, extra cash, to get it to people who need it. So if McDonald's, as we were just saying, needs a short-term loan through an instrument which we call commercial paper, in order to pay, pay its workers, McDonald's has to find someone somewhere who's willing to lend it money on a short-term basis, three months, six months, whatever, in order for it to pay its workers. And, and fortunately, there's millions of people, thousands of people, hundreds of thousands of people, and institutions around the world who meet in the capital markets and exchange cash in, for stocks, for bonds, for short-term uh, commercial paper. So investors look for financial instruments in which to invest. And, and, and while the capital markets aren't really a place like a shopping mall, they're, they're really an online platform. Now, at one point in time, they were a physical place. Look, the New York Stock Exchange still exists, and there's still some transactions. And if you go back a couple hundred years, well, more than a couple hundred years, maybe 250 years at this point, uh, there were, you know, people did used to meet under a buttonwood tree at the court, uh, corner of uh, Wall and Broad, and they exchanged scraps of stocks for cash. That's kind of where it physically started. Um, in Japan, there was a, a rice market where uh, rice was grown in Kyoto, uh, but it was traded in Tokyo, and they actually used uh, mirrors to transfer prices um, back and forth between, um, uh, between Kyoto and Tokyo. So even before all the technology that we had, people were very ingenious about creating fundamental capital markets. But nowadays, capital markets are online platforms, not dissimilar to eBay, not dissimilar to Amazon, where people exchange cash for financial instruments. And, and by the way, they also inf we also inform each other over these online platforms, what are the prices of stocks, what are interest rates and all that. So, so they're not really a place, they are a market, but they're not really a place, they're online as is what we're doing today and, and many other things that happen uh, here in the 21st century. So, Financial markets, capital markets facilitate the exchange of cash for financial instruments. So um, what are the types of investors, who are the people who have cash, who are the people who have money to invest? These people are individuals. As we've just said, when you put money into a savings account or a checking account, you're helping a bank create loans for its customers, or you're saving money for some future a thing you want to achieve, uh, buying a house, uh, sending your child to college, whatever the case might be. So individuals are extremely important components of the capital markets. We just said banks are important. Banks, banks have excess capital. They have your money in the form of deposits, and they lend out that money, or sometimes they invest short-term in the bond market. Insurance companies, I think for most of us not always daily involved in the in the financial markets we might think of just insurance companies as people who just insure us against car accidents problems with our homes um, liability things of that nature um, but in reality insurance companies with the premiums that you pay them every month or every quarter to insure something they invest that money 
trillions and trillions of dollars around the planet. Insurance companies are major, major investors in the financial markets. Pension funds, these are organizations set up by governments and corporations designed to take money from either a government or a corporation or an individual right now, invested for a very long period of time, and at some point in the future, when a person retires, that person is paid some sort of retirement income or some lump sum amount, as we call it, um, at the point that they retire to help with their retirement and enjoying their old age. So those are the people who have cash and they need to put it someplace. Because obviously, if you just leave cash in your mattress or in the drawer, it doesn't do anything for you. So what do they do? They need to meet borrowers in the financial markets, individuals. Sometimes people need to borrow, as we said earlier, to fund for college, to fund for the purchase of a home, the down payment down the home, or, or whatever the case might be. Some people are fortunate to have extra income, uh, extra capital. They invest so that they can make more money into the future. Corporations are borrowers. As we just said, McDonald's frequently borrows short term in order to pay its suppliers, to pay its, its employees. Multiple companies around the world do that. Corporations will also borrow for longer term projects factories, office buildings, perhaps to fund research into a new drug or, or a new type of semiconductor. Governments are significant borrowers as well. Most governments around the world tend to run some sort of deficit because they tend to spend a bit more than they tax, but governments are doing essential things. Uh, we pay for police, we pay for firemen. At the central government level, we also pay for, pension, for social security type benefits and medical benefits for older people. So governments are significant, perhaps the greatest borrowers in, in the global financial markets. So again, as you can see in the little illustration there, we have the buyers and the, the investors and the borrowers rather meeting online virtually um, to exchange cash for financial instruments so that the borrower can go ahead and do whatever it is they have to do. And so that the individual, the banks, insurance companies can realize what inv whatever investment objectives they have in mind for themselves. And of course, those vary person to person. So um, as we said, and we kind of covered this already, individuals borrow to buy a house, pay for college, buying a car or another expensive purchase. Cars, of course, are, are, are not cheap. Pay for home improvements is a significant marketplace in the United States and, and, and in other countries. And it's a significant driver of financial, of, of economic activity. If you are adding an addition to your house, you have to pay the workmen, you have to buy equipment. All this stuff is what drives the economy. Corporations, as we mentioned earlier, as Jimmy mentioned earlier, you know, you come up with an idea, you come up with an organizational structure, you know, you do have to fund that. So companies need to build new factories, um, developers, real estate developers, uh, uh, and other people who invest in real estate need to build office buildings, apartment buildings, shopping centers. Uh, corporations uh, borrow to buy other companies. Uh, a couple of years ago, Warner Brothers, the famous Hollywood movie studio, was purchased by AT&T. AT&T felt that this would be a strategic area of growth for them, and AT&T borrowed money in the financial markets in order to finance that purchase. And also, the, and this is the, the core thing, and we're going to talk about this a little bit more later when we talk about IPOs, but you help finance new products and, and, and new ideas and new services. And, and, and innovation and the, fin the funding of innovation is maybe the most important thing that the capital markets do. A lot of the technologies that, that we have today, even simple things like cable TV, mobile phones, you know, weren't necessarily around 30 or 40 years ago. At some point, somebody went to the capital markets to fund their companies and to create all the, the great services and technologies that we enjoy today. Um, so uh, on the other side of it, as we've been saying, the, the individual with cash meets the person who needs cash. Why do individuals invest? As we've been saying, save for a down payment on house, pay for college retirement, increasing their wealth by investing extra cash into stocks and bonds. Those of us who are fortunate enough to have extra capital that they don't need to spend for day-to-day -day needs tend to save it, or most of the wise people, of course, save it. Some people do other things. But you can increase your wealth by investing in equities. You can make income by investing in bonds. So, so that's a significant source of investment capital for the rest of the world. And, and I think we've talked about the fact that pension benefits are paid to workers when they retire by pension funds. Insurance benefits are paid to people when they make a claim. And of course, many financial institutions like Morgan Stanley, for instance, you invest with them so that they can make money for you as a client over the course of time. So that's why institutions invest. Um, to kind of start maybe 
closing it out and looking at the types of financial instruments that we have in the financial markets, the two main instruments are stocks and bonds. Equities and fixed income is a more fancy term for both, but stocks and bonds. So let's just take a quick look at, at each one. So stock markets around the world let people invest in companies that they believe will grow and prosper in, in the future. Um, you know, we'll, both Jimmy and I will talk about this more a little bit later, but the reality is, you know, picking a company that, that you think will grow and will do very, very well in the future is tough. You have to believe in the management, you have to believe in the products, but the idea is to buy something at a hundred right now and hopefully sell it at a million dollars in the future or, or buying Apple, um, um, uh, and hoping that it goes up significantly in price as we'll see in a moment. So stocks, also known as equities, are, are actual ownership products that give you a very small fractional ownership of a company. So, and, and this is kind of based on current numbers. So today, or earlier this week, if you bought 1,000 shares of Apple, you owned 0.00000023% of the company. It's very tiny. Obviously, it's almost insignificant. But you are indeed an owner of Apple. You might not own as much as Tim Cook or a big mutual fund or the Jobs family, but you are still an owner. And that ownership gives you certain rights. You participate in the growth of Apple if the company continues to do well. You earn dividends. Extra profits that management doesn't need to fund the company are paid to stockholders in the form of dividends. And these things are important to many investors. A lot of investors live off dividends. So and you also have rights, voting rights in many countries, not to say all countries are not all the same, but in many countries you have voting rights and you can help pick the board members, the CEO, the senior management of the, of the, um, of the company. It's no different from if a friend is starting a restaurant or a dry cleaning store or a pet shop or whatever, and you give them some money and the friend gives you 25% of the company, 15% of the company, whatever it might be, that ownership might be more significant, but it's the same concept in the public marketplace. So that's the equity market, that's the stock market. And by the way, the stock market, things have moved around lately, but let's say the stock markets globally are worth about $80 trillion. So there's a huge amount of wealth in, in the stock market. So let, let's, let's move towards wrapping this up by talking about the bond markets. Bond markets put together people who wish to lend money now and receive it back at some point in the future. The lender receives interest. And a good way to think about interest is a rent that you pay to borrow money for a certain period of time. Okay, it could be a month, it could be a year, it could be whatever. Um, oops, sorry about that. I, I kind of hit the wrong button there and I apologize. Uh, so where were we? So interest is the rent that you pay on the use of capital for a certain period of time. Okay, and, and, and the rent that you pay uh, for dollars might be a little bit different from yen. Yen might be a bit different from, from pound sterling but it is the, the, what you pay the lender for using money for a certain period of time. So bonds are really like loans that need to be paid back. So let's say you have a friend and your friend says, hey, can you loan me 20 bucks today, $20 today? And the friend says, I'll pay you back in a month and I'll give you $2 in interest. So a month later, if everything goes well and your friend shows up and he's an honest person, um, you get your $20, which is your principal, and then you get $2 in interest. Now, bonds are a little bit more complex than that because you can trade them. And actually, we have on the screen here an old-style U.S. Treasury uh, certificate from uh, mid-20th century, actually 1978-79, and I think is the approximate uh, issuance of that bond. That bond, you can take that certificate. Nowadays, they're in electronic form. And you can sell it to somebody else. We'll get, we get more into this when we do the full course, uh, which we hope you join us for in the near future. Um, because some of this stuff uh, is a bit time consuming, complex, but is something we will address. Jimmy's, Jimmy's sections will, will expand as well. But we wanted here just to give you kind of a basic introduction to the concepts that we're going to be talking about. So I think with that in mind, I'm going to turn it back over to my colleague, uh, Ashley, and she'll uh, lead us into Jimmy's next segment. Great. Thank you so much. And for anyone that is joining a little bit late, I just wanted to recircle and give some brief introductions of our instructors that are participating in the presentations today. And also remind everyone that we will be doing a Q&A at the end of the session. So if you do have questions, please use the feature, the Q&A feature at the bottom of your Zoom um, platform here. So real quick, just wanted to share my screen and introduce again 
Jimmy Pang. And Jimmy, what he's presenting today is targeted for uh, the middle school audience. And he, you know, he's going through just the differences about um, how businesses are developed and also really going into how to make good investment decisions. And so his next topic here is gonna go over just building a business, learning the outcomes, the introduction of an income statement. And right now, I would just like to let you know that he has a lot of experience in portfolio management and macroeconomics teaching at New York Institute of Finance. And he also is a visiting professor at NYU and teaches courses in portfolio management and applied equity research. And I'm gonna turn it over to Jimmy and he can also give a light introduction of some of his experience because something that we do at Knife that's different is that we work with people that are real life practitioners. So they're not only coming in with real experience, you know, they're able to connect with the students and help them learn desk ready skills that they can apply right away. All right, well, I'm gonna go ahead and stop my screen and let you take it, Jimmy. Thank you, thank you, Ashley. Uh, yes, uh, you know, as Ashley mentioned, um, you know, I do uh, uh, teach uh, young adults uh, as well as advanced uh, uh, finance to the master's degree uh, students at, at NYU. Uh, I think what I, what I may not have mentioned is also um, I work with uh, high net worth uh, families, and of course, uh, families um, also have um, young adults uh, within the, the high net worth family. Uh, so uh, I think we're hopefully we're all able to uh, gauge our audience um, and engage our audience uh, across all levels um, of their uh, experience, uh, age, and expertise. Uh, so I'm happy to share uh, a little bit more with you. Uh, Chris had mentioned uh, stocks. Um, and stocks um, are actually companies, right? So every day you deal with companies. Uh, and of course, just like uh, your homework, uh, sort of your grades, uh, you actually have to measure um, how well a company does uh, as well, uh, right? How do you compare um, how well one company does with another uh, and their sort of uh, credit card or, or report card, if you will, their report card, uh, would be something that you analyze and can take a look at with regard to numbers. Uh, and, and one of those report cards, you could say, um, is uh, uh, something called the income statements, which hopefully um, all of you will uh, get to know very, very well uh, at some point in the future, you'll be analyzing more and more of these. Uh, we're, 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 we're just gonna go through a very basic example. Uh, again, this is just a, a very simple example of what an income statement might look like uh, and what are sort of the, the terms that you may need to understand. Uh, you know, every company you come across, you know, even when you build uh, your own company, uh, you're gonna have to make some forecasts and develop an income statement uh, because really at the end of the day, you have to figure out if you're making money or not, right? If you're making, not making money, um, then that might be a problem. Uh, so let's uh, actually begin to explore um, just a, um, basic building blocks of uh, income statements. And let me see if I can make sure I can, uh... okay, there we go. Uh, so, you know, one of the things that, that we, we like to do um, in, or at least, uh, you know, I like to do in the classes and I'm sure other classes will do the same, uh, is to have uh, in students interact with each other, uh, begin to use the, your own uh, creative mind to think for yourself. Um, and have some of these breakout uh, sessions, if you will, to interact with your peers and to be guided by uh, mentors uh, uh, or uh, uh, teachers just as ourselves. Uh, and for now, we're gonna start with a basic, uh, let's say frozen yogurt stand, just to give you a taste of what an income statement might look like. Uh, so, you know, here are some questions that you might wanna ask yourself, right, before we begin, uh, is what would you need to even uh, begin to develop a yogurt stand? right, a yogurt business. So I'm sure all of us have gone to the corner store uh, to, to buy something either like a yogurt or a smoothie, um, et cetera, and you're gonna need some materials um, and you're going to need a facility, right, unless you're selling it out of your, your parents' garage. Uh, so, you know, here's some, just some basic uh, materials that you might need from a blender machine to obviously the main ingredient being yogurt, um, and what are some extras, if you will, in terms of toppings um, or yogurt. Uh, the, and then, of course, you're going to need some, some of the, the basic things like uh, spoons and, and, and cups. Um, uh, so to, to, to make each, uh, each, uh, each person come and you know, what they might buy, right? 
Let me see. Make sure I'm in here. Okay. Uh, and here's some other breakout activity uh, questions that we might entertain with regards to the group. Uh, is you know how how much might you sell your yogurts for right so these are certainly things to think about uh, what uh, what your cost might be right so that might determine what your margin is so that's a fancy term uh, with respect to how much money you can make above and beyond your costs and that would be the profitability uh, some of the things that might determine how much you you're going to sell that particular product for it doesn't have to be yogurt of course is to look at what competitors are Right? So some of you might like Coke and some of you might like Pepsi. Right? Why are they priced very similarly is because they're, you know, very, uh, there's very high competition between the two. So an example with regard to yogurt might be ice cream. Right? Uh, and of course, this is just a very simple example. We're going to go to more complex examples within the class. Um, and ultimately, you know, what are people willing to pay? Uh, revenues. We first start with revenues, and that's just a fancy term for something called uh, for sales, right? Uh, and one of the measures that you could look at with regard to uh, a company that's you know selling yogurt uh, or certain products is you know what's the price per cup that somebody walks in and is willing to pay? Uh, what are you going to sell it at? Right? It has to meet together uh, the price per cup and then the number of cups you sell, and that's called volume, right? So that's going to determine how much uh, sales you can make within that particular hour, right? You could break it down with by hour. Uh, you could break it down by day. And then of course the month and year, right? Uh, and in addition to what you might think about selling with regard to the, this main product, uh, what are some extra items you might sell, right? So think about your own customer experience when you walk into a store. You know, how, how does that particular um, business get more money from your pocket? Right? Instead of just $5, are they going to charge a little bit more because you added blueberries or you added um, some other beverage, you know, drinks to your, to your order? So it's a similar to a restaurant. Right? When you go with your family, how much does each person spend? Uh, so there are fancier terms, of course. Uh, and the fancy term here might be average revenue per customer. Right? So that's a fancy way of saying how much money uh, does each person spend when they walk into a store. Right, so when you add all those up per customer, again, that's your sales. Uh, and certainly there are other add-on add items that I mentioned. Again, when you walk into it, maybe it's not as simple as the frozen yogurt uh, stand, but it might be a restaurant. Right? So you're going to order other things like fruits and salads um, and other items, which adds to the bill, I, I might, add, uh, I might uh, mention. So I don't know if any of you guys are paying the bill. I'm certainly somebody is, uh, or your parents are. So the more items you add, the bigger the bill, right, per person. Uh, now, obviously, with respect to sales, there are expenses uh, that you have to deal with and consider, right? How expensive are the items or raw ingredients that you're buying? Uh, and it might have to do with quality. You could buy the cheapest ingredient, but it's not going to taste as good. You could buy the most expensive ingredient, and it tastes great. Then the question is, how much more can you charge for that product? But it tastes really good, right? So can you charge more because it tastes the best on the block? Um, now, with regard to cost of goods sold, that's again going back to expenses. That's kind of the raw ingredients, and this is just with regard to this example. It's the yogurt, milk, sugar, rice, etc. Um, cups, spoons, and straws that you need to to provide that product. In addition to these expenses, of course, there are other expenses. And that's gonna be if you wanna hire a cashier, right? You wanna hire somebody who's standing outside of your store to do some marketing, right? So some of you might have, if you're in New York, you might see people standing on the corner and holding up sort of Subway sandwich signs. And you have to pay that person and that's called marketing costs. So some of the main costs uh, with this term called SG&A uh, is uh, your labor, uh, your rent, right? Uh, and some advertising. Uh, and you know, certainly there's advertising with respect to these products that you see out in the street and stores, but if you're online, you're also gonna see a lot of advertising, right? So when you guys go on YouTube, you're always interrupted by these ads, and that's marketing uh, by those products. So here's uh, just a very basic example of what an income statement looks like. You can see what I mentioned, revenues is sales. Uh, and that's offset with the cost of each ingredient. Um, here, I kind of broke it down by 
just uh, the very basic item. If you bought one sort of smoothie or frozen yogurt, uh, obviously if you add it up by the number of, uh, of smoothies that you sell, that becomes your total sales. But I just sort of broke it down just so you guys can see more simply um, in this sort of um, uh, teaser uh, what it might look like with regard to one particular item. Uh, so you can see the basic cost there, right? It's, it, you can see that it's, it's fairly easy to understand with regard to this example. Uh, and then you have something called gross profit after your sort of raw, co raw material costs. Uh, uh, sales minus your cost of goods gives you your gross profit. And then, of course, you have your costs, as I mentioned, of advertising uh, wages. I don't have rent here, uh, so I should have rent here. Uh, and you can spread those rent costs over sort of the number of items you sell. Uh, but we'll go through these sort of obviously, you know, more fancy terms uh, during the actual course of what's called gross profit, operating profit. And you might also want to think about percentages and you can divide, you can do, go even further advanced and divide a uh, gross profit over sales, uh, operating profit over sales, costs over sales, right? So start to think in percentages about, you know, what it takes to make your profit and your company um, uh, uh, even, even greater. Uh, one last thing I'll mention uh, with regard to a summary in this particular section is a way that uh, business folks think about their expenses um, in addition to these sort of breakdowns of, of cost of goods sold and what's called SG&A, uh, selling general and admin, that's what SG&A stands for, uh, selling general and admin, um, is also to think about costs uh, regard to how much, how it relates to the items that you're selling. So if you think about, you know, if you're selling uh, uh, the yogurt, you, you obviously need each cup to hold that item. So the more yogurt you sell, the more cups you'll need. In other words, there's a direct relationship with regard to the yogurt um, and some of these costs uh, and the fancy term is variable costs, sort of changing. So variable means changing. As opposed to if you actually rented a store, you actually have to pay that rent no matter what. So I don't know if you guys know that because you may not have rented a store, but there's what's called a fixed cost. Doesn't matter if you sell five cups or a thousand cups, you still have to pay, uh, you know, the three thousand dollars in rent per month, uh, let's say, um, and that's no matter what. So these costs are, are fixed. You know, if you hire a cashier, you really probably have to pay that cashier some type of fixed amount per month so they can make a living, right? Uh, so those are just some uh, fancy terms um, and uh, sort of concepts with regard to the basic income statement. Uh, that's probably as simple as it gets. And of course, uh, we will get a bit more advanced. And the beauty of it will, is we'll actually uh, go through some examples, uh, some very simple examples later on. Uh, but obviously during the modules, we'll go through some uh, advanced and more complex examples uh, with, with companies that you, you know and uh, items that you know, uh, whether it's mobile phones or gaming consoles uh, or Snapchat. Uh, okay, so with that, uh, let me actually turn it back to um, Ashley. Okay. Thank you very much. All right, so really great to hear everything about you know learning the basic theory about building a business. So now we're gonna imagine that we've established a business, we're running it for a couple of years and achieve impressive outcomes, and then we want to expand and further grow our business. So we're gonna revisit Capital Markets and I'm inviting back Chris Thomas and I'm just gonna share my screen because if anyone's joining a little bit late, I'd like the opportunity to reintroduce Chris here. One second. All right, so Chris is Knife Senior Lecturer in the areas of Asset Management and the Family Office. He's the Managing Director at, the, at Simon Quick LLC, a multifamily office based in Morristown, New Jersey and New York City. And today, Chris is gonna to talk to us about the IPO. And I'll also leave it to you to give us a little more background if you'd like. Uh, no, that's, that's great. I, I... Why talk about me? I'd rather talk about IPOs. They're a lot more interesting than me. So thanks for that, Ashley. I appreciate it. So let's, um, let's talk about that. And, and, and as Ashley mentioned, and uh, oops, sorry, um, I should open up. Here we go. As Ashley mentioned, um, this kind of segues out of what Jimmy was talking about. And Jimmy was talking about some of the, the basic financial metrics that we use 
to analyze a company. And it could be a yogurt store, it could be Taiwan Semiconductor, it could be Intel, it could be Tesla. But if a company does become successful, if it's getting traction, as we to use a trendy business term, uh, and revenues are going up, uh, profits are going up, people have faith in the management, and you've seen um, uh, investors, professional investors, give money to the company for it to grow, at some point, you're probably going to see an IPO. So what's an IPO? It's a common term, but just let's make sure we define it. IPOs are initial public offerings. And, 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 and Jimmy touched on this, but I just want to expand in his segment earlier, but I want to expand on it. Um, it was a good segue into the, into the capital markets thing, but let's expand on it a little bit more. Corporations, um, and let me just go forward a little bit because I think it's kind of important. Corporations, companies, are, are business organizations. So you want to sell yogurt, you want to sell semiconductors, you want to sell electric cars, whatever it is that you wish to do, you know, go do whatever you want, whatever you're good at, but you need a legal structure. And almost every country in the world has some sort of series of laws, body of laws that govern the creation of corporations and, and companies. I think the first, first company was the British East India Company, I think back in like 1750. And of course, legal, uh, the law has evolved since then. But companies have a few things in common wherever they may be around the world. So they're legal organizations. They're started by some individual, a man or a woman who has some idea as to what they want to do, a business idea, a business to, a venture that they wish to pursue. They set up a company. And, and, and one key thing, uh, and Jimmy touched on this, they protect their own liability, their personal liability for something that might happen at the, st at the company. They don't do this to evade accountability, but they do this to make sure that if there is something that goes on in the company, they themselves are not at personal risk, and this allows them to take some sort of entrepreneurial risk. So companies are organized in this way. They need funding. We talked about the capital markets in the earlier segment. They can borrow from, uh, when they get big enough, they can borrow in the bond market and the equity market. But when they're private, they need initial boost of capital. And where does that typically come from? Now, the, the very initial uh, boost of capital, when the company is in the proverbial garage, like Google started in the garage, Apple started in the garage. When you're in the garage phase and it, you've got an idea for a search engine or a, a personal computer, typically that money comes from what we call angel investors. If you take Jeff Bezos, who started Amazon, where did his initial money come from? Is his brother Mark, his parents, other friends and family. But when a company gets to a certain point where there's real traction, there's revenue is growing, profitability is growing, there's demand for goods or services, venture capital firms come in, VC firms, and you've probably heard a lot about them. These are firms that are taking tremendous risks by investing in new businesses. You know, most people don't invest in new businesses. Those are, they're risky, they could fail, anything could happen, right? But VCs take significant risk. They do a lot of homework analyzing a company. And they say to themselves, look, this is, this is a good business. This is a good management team, whatever the case might be. So they inject money into the company. And in exchange for that, this is sort of like a private version of the capital market that we talked about earlier. The capital markets are big and public. They involve thousands, if not millions, of individual players. In the private markets, in the VC markets, we have one, two, three people who found a company, one, two, three, four people who are VCs. They get together and they say, listen, I'll give you $10 million for 10% of your company, or whatever the case might be. So when, when companies start their businesses, they're privately held. They're owned by the founders and the venture capitalists. They are not traded on an exchange like the New York Stock Exchange, the Tokyo Stock Exchange, or the London Stock Exchange. That's a big thing. They're, they're privately held. Only a few people have all the stock of the company. There's still stock, just like there is when we talk about IBM or Toyota or British Petroleum. Sure, there's stock, but it's not traded. It's held amongst a small group of people. So at some point, the company grows. And the company grows to the point where they need more capital. They also go to the point where the venture capital people need to sell their stock because they want to take profits and then move on to invest in other companies, which is a very key thing that they do and a very, very, very important supporter of the economy. That's, and we'll get into that in a few minutes. But let's, instead of me talking, why don't we talk about an IPO for a company that has gathered, garnered a great deal of attention over the last five to 10 years, and that's Uber.
Uber tends to operate, in, it operates in every part of the world. So let's look at a little bit at the history of Uber and, and it'll give us some insight into how um, IPOs work. And, and as we said earlier, you know, this is kind of just a snapshot of what the overall IPO module of this course will look like. We're trying to give people a flavor for it. We'll get more into this. But Uber, I think, is a fascinating case study as to how IPOs work, uh, especially because it's high profile. It was an innovative new business. So let's just talk about it and look at the timeline. So 2009, not that long ago, Travis Kalanick and Garrett Camp, the two founders of Uber, were, were, in, a cab, were in a cab in Paris. And it had taken them a long time to find that cab. And if I recall correctly, it was New Year's Eve 2009. And the, the amount of cabs uh, in Paris is limited by government regulation. It's hard to find a cab, especially New Year's Eve. If you're a New Yorker, you, you know that used to be the case as well, pre-Uber. Um, so I don't know if it's Travis to Garrett or Garrett to Travis, but they say, hey, listen, wouldn't it be cool if we had an iPhone or an Android phone, we just press a button and a cab showed up. Well, they go back to San Francisco and instead of you know, sitting on their couch and watching TV, they actually start to implement this business. And in 2010, they, they launch UberCab. In 2011, uh, Uber got its first venture capital professional investment, $11 million from Benchmark Capital, one of, the, one of the great VC firms in the United States. And in exchange for that, they got a percentage of stock in the company. I, I don't know what the exact percentage was, but call it 5%, 10%, whatever it might have been. So you had an ownership group now that was Travis, Garrett, whatever friends and family initially funded them, and then benchmark. Later in 2011, Uber gets more money in exchange for stocks. So they sell some more stock in exchange for cash to grow the business. This time it's Jeff Bezos, who also started with uh, venture capital, and the great investment bank Goldman Sachs on behalf of its clients. In 2012, Uber launches in the UK. In the United States, a competitor called Lyft, which does operate in the rest of the world, so for those of you outside of the U.S., you may not know about Lyft, but it's a local competitor, Uber, here in the United States, started in 2012. Uh, another significant event, Uber launches its Uber X service, which is the online or the cab sharing, car sharing service that, that made them famous around the world. So that's a big year, 2012. In 2014, uh, BlackRock, one of the largest, actually the largest asset management firm in the world, came in, came in with some capital. 2016, Saudi Arabia invested three and a half billion into the company. And, and because that was a significant sum, sum of money, Saudi Arabia negotiated that uh, the person who runs the Saudi government's, what we call sovereign wealth fund. This is a, a government organization that runs Saudi Arabia's wealth that it generates from selling oil to the rest of the world. Um, that, that entity is called the Public Investment Fund. The head of that sat on the board because uh, with three and a half billion dollars invested in the company, obviously Saudi Arabia wanted somebody to observe the day-to-day -day operations of the business. In uh, 2017, Travis resigned as CF, uh, CEO of the company. A huge amount of capital, 8.7 billion, came into the company from SoftBank, Tencent, TPG, and others. Uh, it valued the company at about 54 billion. This is privately held still. Um, then in 2009, we have this significant event that we've been leading up to. Uber goes public in an IPO managed by Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley. Travis Kalanick takes, uh, sells his stock to the public. Uh, Benchmark sells its stock to the public. Other investors sell their stock to the public. Billions of dollars comes into the company, allowing them to grow and expand further. And it also allowed private public, uh, individuals, pension funds, the other types of people we talked about uh, in the um, in the capital market section to participate in what hopefully will be a prosperous future uh, for Uber over the course of time. So, so this was a significant development. Um, so what happened when Uber went public? As we said, the company was no longer owned just by its founders and some of its investors like BlackRock and Goldman. It's owned now by thousands, thousands of individuals, multiple institutions around the world. As we, as we mentioned, Benchmark sold out uh, and got its capital back. It then and this is a really important thing, so I just want to emphasize it one more time. A, a venture capital firm will sell its stock. In this case, Benchmark made a significant amount of money. It returns some of that money to its investors uh, in forms of profits. And then it takes some of that capital and reinvests uh, in other startup companies. So the cycle continues. And if everything goes well, we have new companies creating new jobs, new services, new opportunities for people, which is the whole point of the exercise, quite candidly. Another significant thing before we wrap up this section is that once a company is public, 
the Securities Exchange Commission here in the United States and other regulatory authorities around the world regulate the company. And they're not telling Uber what to do and how to price its services. What they are saying, though, is you are a public company. You have, as we've mentioned, thousands of investors and institutional clients or uh, investors around the world. You need to provide them with some level of information. How are you, uh, the same stuff that Jimmy was talking about in his previous segment. What are your revenues? What are your profits? What are your expenses? Uh, what is your view on, on, on the business going forward? Typically, every quarter when this is released, um, the uh, senior management team of a public company, Uber, whoever, will get on a earnings call and talk to investors. Mostly Wall Street firms are asking the questions, but by extension, they're talking to all their investors around the world as to how they're doing. So this is a very, very important thing because remember, as we were saying earlier, when Saudi Arabia invested its three and a half billion dollars into the company, it had a senior Saudi Arabian official sit on the company's board because they wanted to know what was going with the company's revenues and profitability and all that. That was when it was private. He had to be in the loop, as we say. But now that the company is public, everybody needs to be in the loop. So that's that's an important aspect of going public. And and we've touched on this IPOs in the economy. Ideally, you want new businesses, new jobs, new for, new ways of doing things. And innovation drives the economy. IPOs drive innovation. I think that's a fairly uh, a good way to look at these things. Um, so that's good from the corporate sector. From the investor sector, remember, IPOs are part of the capital markets. I, capital markets put together people who need to invest with people who need the investment capital. If, you're, if you do well and you're, you're fortunate, um, and you've done your homework properly and the management does its homework properly. Maybe you can be like an Apple shareholder who in 1980, if you bought at the IPO, the day of the IPO, and you held it to today, you've made 76,000% with dividends, reinvestments, et cetera, et cetera, on the stock. And, and if you look at the market cap, and I, I probably couldn't make the 1980 Apple logo as small as it should have been, but the market cap, the value of uh, Apple on its IPO date in 1980 is 1.8 billion. Apple is now one, worth 1 1.3 trillion dollars. So a lot of iPhones, a lot of Macs, a lot of iPads um, have led to the company being one of the most successful ventures uh, in, in the history of capitalism. So if everything goes right, that's what happens. But at the very least, uh, we're hoping we're creating jobs, opportunities, new services, and new products for uh, for people around the world. So with that. Um, Ash, I'm going to turn it back over to you. That was great. Thank you. So now we're going to finish up with our final session with Jimmy Peng. You know, now we know the role of the IPO and the opportunities that create wealth by investing in those IPOs. And think about who's invested in Uber or Apple when they went public. But not so many people are as lucky as the people that, you know, made the right decision on Uber or Apple in the beginning. So now we want to talk with Jimmy about, you know, investing wisely. and the term diversification, what does that mean? And how can we do that? Also jump into a few case studies that go back to some of the things that Jimmy was talking about. Jimmy, wanna take it away? Great, thank you again. Uh, okay, let me share the final uh, example uh, presentation. Let me see if I can do this properly. Uh, okay. Uh, so I'm sure many of you recognize the examples of these logos. Uh, and Chris did a, a fine job of mentioning uh, an example that uh, perhaps you know, a lot of people use around the world now, which is Uber. And that's really the best way to learn, right? Is the best way to learn is through examples, uh, what we call case studies, um, and things you can relate to, right? So I imagine if you can study all of these companies that you see here on this list, uh, you could all end up being uh, great uh, business analysts um, and investors uh, because these are all uh, fairly good companies. Uh, and so let me just touch upon a few more uh, business case examples uh, that we would have uh, throughout these, uh, these modules. And I'll just go through just some very simple slides. And of course, you know, this is going to expand upon what we just did, which is the income statement. Uh, many of these companies are going to be measured somewhat differently. So we'll go through just some uh, different examples. Uh, the first, uh, Chris has already talked about uh, Apple in terms of the phone. And what he may not have mentioned or in, in such detail is 
right? How do they make so much money? <laughs> you can even ask yourself what makes their products so much better. You know, why wouldn't you buy a Samsung phone uh, over an iPhone, right? So that's a question for you to answer um, and, you know, millions of people around the world. Uh, and one of the things that Apple does very well, uh, aside from designing their phones, is to be an extremely profitable company, right? So we went through the frozen yogurt example. Uh, here's actually a breakdown of the major costs, uh, right? Cost of goods sold. So we have that term again of, of a phone. Uh, this goes back a couple of years, so it might be a little bit different now. Uh, but, you know, some of the examples of the costs that go into your phone, right? So if you actually took apart your phone, you'll, will, you will find what's called a NAND flash chip, a DRAM chip that, right, you have to have a memory for all your pictures and everything you store on it. And the mo one of the most expensive things is, is, of course, the display, right? So I think everybody has probably cracked their screen at some point, uh, and you have to buy a new display. That's It's actually fairly expensive. Um, and you have other uh, sort of power management um, and electromagnetic things that, that go into uh, it for all you scientists. Uh, but at the end of the day, uh, it actually costs them like $200 to make the phone. And guess what? It's such a great brand, they can charge $600 to $700 uh, and even up to $1,000 these days. So, you know, if you can imagine, you can create a product that's so good um, and the brand name is so strong, you could charge $1,000 for your product and yet it only costs you $300 to make. Right? Of course, there's other costs that we discussed earlier with regard to marketing and rent and things like that, right? The beautiful Apple store. Uh, but this is, you know, just another example um, of how a business can can um, generate uh, huge amounts of uh, profits, actually. Um, and these are some of the things that we could talk about uh, as a group as well, right? What makes the company so great? What makes their marketing so great? You know, who are they targeting, right? They, you know, what's the youngest age somebody can get a Mac or an iPhone? Um, and, you know, the beauty of their product is that it appeals to many, many uh, people throughout uh, sort of any age and what we call demographic. Um, that's a fancy term for uh, sort of the segment, the population that you're targeting. Uh, just some other examples. Again, these are these are very well-known examples that hopefully uh, you can relate to. If you don't relate to Apple, you know, hopefully you can look down at your feet and you can see a pair of, uh, it could be Nikes or, or Adidas, um, right? What some of you might not know is, right, how much does Nike make per shoe? Right, so one of the examples is that, uh, of course, not all the, the whole hundred dollars that you pay for the Nike shoe doesn't all go to Nike. Uh, they do split that with uh, what's called the retailer, which is the actual store. Uh, so let's say, again, just with regard to this example, uh, Nike might take $50 of that $100 shoe. Uh, and what's the breakdown of those costs? And in this case, we actually do have the cost to produce the cost of goods as $22. And the rest goes to marketing, rent, staff, um, and Nike is basically left with $5 of the $50. Uh, and if you take five divided by 50, that's essentially what's called a 10% net profit margin, which is not too bad. It's actually not as high as Apple, but it's not too bad. Uh, but of course, now Nike is you know, a globally known brand um, and uh, they actually sell millions and millions of shoes, right? So uh, that's just one other example that we can discuss uh, many questions. Uh, one of the most interesting questions, um, I know the answer to this, uh, you might not, uh, but we're gonna study in the class, uh, you know, how much does Nike actually pay their athletes? Right, so you might see, uh, I don't know, Steph Curry or LeBron James or Michael uh, Jordan, uh, they're gonna be endorsed by Nike. How much do they actually get? And you know, how much actually per shoe does it goes into that cost? Right, it's actually, uh, right around $2, $2.50. Um, so that's actually part of marketing costs. Right? So that's just an example of some of the things you would learn um, in these modules. Um, oh, let me go back to my, my reading view. Um, oh, sorry, I uh, went to a different section there. Here we go. Let me go back to the reading view. Um, okay. Um, and just a, uh, the final couple examples, I won't through, go through uh, all of them in, in such detail, uh, but just some other examples of case studies uh, might be a Nintendo uh, is, uh, you know, if you're not into basketball, right? Uh, so this is gaming. 
and we're going to explore, right? Uh, how does Nintendo make money? Um, you know, would do if versus uh, an Xbox, right? The one of the interesting concepts is uh, they're actually they actually want to sell you the console. Um, they might not make a lot of money selling the console to you. They make a lot of the money on selling the games, actually, right? They want to sell Legend of Zelda to you, uh, Super Mario Brothers, and they make more money on what's called software rather than hardware. So that's one of the concepts we explore. Uh, some of you guys might uh, might have a subscription to Netflix, and how does Netflix make money? All right, so one of my favorite uh, episodes, uh, I've uh, finished watching Stranger Things, and I'm waiting for sort of season four, uh, but you know, what are the costs of Netflix, right? They don't make shoes. Um, they make the, and create what's called content. And that's their version of sort of cost of goods, right? So it's not like a, a cotton or, you know, uh, chips that go into an Apple phone, but it's actually creating an episode of something that you're willing to pay to watch. Um, and there are, of course, costs involved uh, in these things, actually quite high costs, and it's called content costs. Um, and the last examples are, are um, something that uh, you may use uh, as an app, which is Snapchat and Facebook, right? Some of the most well-known examples. Um, and this goes back to one of the concepts you learned earlier, uh, average revenue per user, right? We use that with regard to yogurt, but now on a more advanced level, you can use these concepts with respect to uh, something as sophisticated as uh, Snapchat um, and Facebook, uh, and they actually generate money from you uh, through advertisements. So they charge other uh, companies uh, to advertise to you. And depending on the number of users, the more users that the app has, right? That's why likes are so important. The more users an app has, uh, the more right eyeballs, so to speak, uh, the more money a company might pay Facebook or Snapchat to get to you. Right, to get to your um, viewing. Uh, so these are uh, just some examples that you can see. Uh, and just the final, the, the, the final topic I'll talk about, uh, just to see if you can relate to it, uh, is the topic of diversification. Right? Diversification uh, is really just a fancy term uh, for spreading of risk, to spread something out. So that uh, a, a phrase might be, you don't wanna put your, all your eggs in one basket. So that might be a phrase you might have come across before. Don't put all your eggs in one basket. That means you want to spread things out so you have a greater return and also spreading out your risk. Uh, one of the examples I like to use is there's a card game. Uh, I used to mentor uh, at uh, a charity, and one of the kids uh, used to play this company called Yu-Gi-Oh! And I picked up all these cards, and uh, I was thinking, wow, this is very interesting. Uh, they all have different power and different abilities, and you can summon different monsters. Um, but the idea is you don't want all the same card because it's the same thing. It's, it's no different than the other. But if you have a different set of cards and different abilities, that seems to be much more valuable than one card that's the same uh, in your whole deck. Um, and that's essentially what's called diversification, sort of spreading out your risk. And you know that's how I relate it to a concept uh, uh, that Chris talked about, which is the stock market, um, you know, a market where all companies are trading and you can have an Apple, a Nike, a Nintendo, right? If they're all good companies, uh, you can help spread your risk rather than just betting on one thing, right? So that's how we put it very simply. Uh, and some of the questions you might ask yourself is, right, how many cards do you actually want? Which powers are best? Um, and uh, the answer is you probably don't want to bet right, uh, just on one card. Um, we're gonna have breakout activities. Uh, again, just an example with regard to Yu-Gi-Oh! And then, you know, maybe even baseball cards if you relate to that in terms of sports. Uh, but certainly something that's near and dear to my heart because I, I grew up on comic books and I used to read a lot of comic books. Uh, as some of you may know, you know, Marvel Entertainment, right, was owned by um, Disney now. And many of you might have seen the Avengers movies. and Right, so this is really interesting where I can think about and relate these financial concepts of diversification. Uh, there's other concepts called correlation, uh, which we won't uh, go into detail here, but uh, in the modules we talk about. Uh, diversification with regard to the Avengers. Right? How do I relate this financial concept uh, to superheroes? You know, how do they uh, go together? Well, 
um, do I want, you know, two Ironmen or, you know, uh, somebody with the same ability of running fast or do I want this, right? Which is more powerful having this team who can do the same or having this team that can complement each other. Okay, so that's just a simple way of thinking about uh, a concept in finance called diversification. Uh, and, um, you know, with regard to this type of program, I certainly sort of wish I had this type of program when I was going to, as I mentioned, uh, Bronx Science. Uh, there are also other parts of this program uh, after um, you study sort of all these modules uh, is uh, there are electives uh, where you can choose to go deeper into some of the things you're even more interested in, uh, which I'm sure Ashley uh, will talk about. Uh, there are uh, research projects uh, within the modules, uh, which you know, help make all of, this, um, all of these concepts even more real um, and uh, uh, very practical. And then finally, I believe you know, after uh, this whole program, you may actually, uh, be, you would be, be eligible for an internship. And for me, uh, I've always believed deeply uh, in uh, practical experience, um, and I was fortunate enough to have an internship uh, when I was, or research an internship when I was younger as well. Uh, it wasn't ne not necessarily within finance, uh, but this one would be sort of a specialization in finance. And uh, the younger you, you start, um, the, the greater an advantage you'll have, and hopefully more opportunities uh, will open up for you. Uh, okay, uh, so let me turn it back over to uh, uh, my colleagues here. All right, thank you so much, Jimmy. So I just wanted to thank Jimmy and Chris for the crash course and for many, probably a refresher course about capital markets and the fundamentals of business and really showing us what we can expect from the Young Finance Scholar Program. And at this time, we are getting closer to the end and we wanted to kind of give an overview of the curriculum of the program and introduce you to the team leader who designed this curriculum and the thought that went into it and the differences between the high school and the middle school curriculum and also our mission to support the student for long-term development. So I just quickly wanted to reintroduce in case you didn't catch it in the beginning is our curriculum director, Jack Farmer. Jack also works as an outside advisor for portfolio managers at a significant global investment fund and has been working, has done many classes for the New York Institute of Finance and is one of our most popular instructors. And I'll let him go ahead and take the lead and share a little bit more about his background, but also really dive into the curriculum so you can really understand what we're offering this summer. Hi, Ashley. So thank you for that introduction and thank you to everyone for uh, you know, being with us this evening. I know that was a pretty long presentation and that it's Sunday night. And I just wanted to close with a talk about you know, generally how the program is structured and what our objectives are. And what you've had an opportunity to do tonight is see some of our instructors see how they handle a lot of different financial topics. And I think the, the thing with the actual courses is that they all have much more time to talk to the students, to start off with something that is relevant to the students' own experience at their own you know, age level, and then build on that and help them gain a, a deeper understanding of not only you know, very advanced topics like IPOs and capital markets, but more practical topics like managing your money, planning, uh, you know, buying a house, buying insurance, things that are you know, important for everyone's day-to-day -day life. So the program itself will be uh, 20 courses for both the middle school and the high school students. And for the middle school students, we'll try to introduce them to more broad topics, more broad concepts and understanding and not really get into quite as much of the detail that we did this evening. For the high school students, we will once again start off with something that is you know, relevant to their own experience. 
and then build on that and you know get into some of the things like what Chris was talking about with IPOs and capital markets and what Jimmy was talking about with um, your income statement, things like that. So, and the 20 courses are just the start. So that is what the certification is. And let me just uh, go here. And the 20 courses begin with very basic concepts. Now this is the uh, course listing from the senior program. And the first thing we start off with is, yeah, how do you develop a financial quotient? So how do you become literate and understand financial concepts so that you can go through life and be successful, to be able to save money, to plan you know, uh, for major purchases, plan for your retirement and so on. And then we go into more uh, advanced topics such as you know, what is macro economy or macroeconomics, microeconomy, look a little bit at wealth and look at how you can analyze a company from different perspectives using financial statements, using business press and so on. We also look at you know, how companies are organized, which we talked about a little bit before. And then look at the bigger picture, which is things like the US financial system, the world financial system, and then, as we had earlier with Chris, an introduction to capital markets and talking a little bit about what is Wall Street, you know, and then what is an IPO, looking more at the stock market, you know, how are stocks traded and so on. And then looking at you know, mergers and acquisitions, understanding the banking system, the credit system, understanding insurance you know as a business not just as a product that all of us uh, buy but as a business which you know comes from those products and then looking more to the future you know looking at what is sustainable finance how can finance be an agent for increasing equality uh, addressing global warming and and other you know uh, things that have a social impact. We'll also look at a global picture of trade and supply chains. And then a little bit looking at the future of finance. So probably some of you have heard of FinTech and there's been a transformation going on in finance, you know, for a number of years, uh, you know, increasing use of technology such as artificial intelligence, machine learning, and also technology such as blockchain and, and Bitcoin. And then we're gonna look at the more practical aspects that Jimmy covered, which are, you know, how do you start a business? How do you make a business successful? And then last, and I think this is very important for young people is, you know, understanding the role of ethics in business, understanding that ethics are, you know, one of the most important aspects of finance and business and understanding you know, how ethics fit into uh, business and how sometimes businesses fail in an ethical sense. And last, we'll look for the senior students, not for the middle school students, at you know, how all of these businesses and markets and everything relate to actual jobs and roles they may eventually have when they graduate from college. So uh, in addition to the 20 programs, so that is the certification, there'll also be a series of electives that come after that. So once you've uh, completed the certification, and these will include things about uh, how to series, you know, how to analyze a company. So kind of digging down into a little bit deeper, uh, looking at real world uh, events, uh, issues in the real world, looking at what the future is likely to look like. And then on a more practical note, we'll talk uh, with admissions counselors. So for many of the high school students, this is a real focus. And one of the things that I think this program allows students to do is, is something that is a outside activity 
that shows that they have a real interest in business and finance and allows them to create a project and a research project that they can use when they apply to universities. Uh, we'll also look at helping students understand what different roles do and understand uh, you know, what their interests are and how their interests may lead them into one career path versus the other. So, um, and then I guess just, you know, I realize it is uh, Sunday evening and we're about at the end of our time. Uh, just wanted to say, you know, I hope you've gotten a, a chance to kind of see our instructors in action, realizing that a lot of the topics that were covered were very advanced. And, you know, in the course itself, uh, more time would be spent, you know, making sure that each student understands each of the topics and the terminology. So uh, I think that's about it for me. You know, uh, did you have uh, something yeah. else, Ashley? Great, thank you, Jack, for walking us through that. You know, um, we do have a few questions that we are receiving from some of the attendees, and I wanted to address the one that is from Wayne. He says, "How will you, um, how will you make the lessons more interactive and engaging?" middle schoolers could easily still lose their focus. Yes, that, that is a particularly different, uh, difficult age for uh, students. And um, as I said, we'll make them interactive by beginning the class with something that the students relate to in their everyday life. And then building on that to a financial concept or a practical uh, thing, like I said, you know, buying insurance or mortgages and financial planning and, and, and generally, but mainly it'll have to be starting with something the students can relate to and then gradually bringing them from that real life experience to, uh, you know, it's, it's uh, how it works in the financial world. Mm -hmm. And maybe just even kind of talking about the delivery, I know we will be using a platform similar to Zoom so there will be video conference, but also the opportunity to have some discussion forums with the instructors and also the other students that are going to be in the program, right? Absolutely. So a lot of the students' experience will be through the learning platform. And so all of the notes and all of the, the slides, everything, all the class materials will be available to the students so they can review that and then if they have questions, the instructors will be available to answer questions. So a lot of the classes will be you know, covering something, but then spending a good bit of the time making sure that everyone understands it and uh, at least the class, you know, not completely uh, overwhelmed, but with you know, some useful understanding. That's right. And I know that we will have some homework as well. Yes, each day, uh, there'll be roughly about a half hour of homework. And so sometimes that homework may be part of, you know, an extension of an activity that was uh, done during the uh, two and a half hour class. And, or it may be a completely separate assignment and the homework will be graded. And so students will be able to apply what they learn in each class uh, to something that they can work on independently. That's great. Another question that we have is, uh, we have Marguerite who's asking if this is the first time we're running a middle school or a program for middle school students. Uh, yes, it is the first time we're running a program for middle school students. And I realize, you know, for a lot of people, the idea of middle school students, you know, learning about finance or learning about, you know, uh, more practical things is, is you know, a little bit radical or more unusual. You don't see, uh, I don't think I've seen another program quite like this, but I know that when I was in middle school and younger, you know, I always wanted to learn more about business, but there was really nothing available to me, uh, you know, at school. And, you know, certainly all of us have parents, you know, who work in some kind of business or in some sort of professional role. But a lot of times, you know, when you go to your parents to get them to explain uh, business or, you know, just financial concepts, 
or even what your parents do, you know, you get a, an answer like, oh, well, I go to meetings or I write a lot of letters or you know, email, you know, things like that. So what we're giving the students is, is an opportunity to interact with business professionals in a classroom environment where they can kind of get a sense of, you know, what it is like to talk to a business professional and interact in that environment. Absolutely. And also a credible resource because I know especially the younger generation likes to utilize platforms like YouTube and there is a lot of content out there and it's hard to really vet what's, you know, quality content. And so what's great is we're able to provide that and really set a foundation for these, you know, young entrepreneurial um, individuals. Yes. And, and as I said, the instructors are all people who are you know, recognized in their area. And obviously, they're not going to be there to provide you know, professional training to the students. But as I said, to just to introduce them to the business world and the financial world. Absolutely. Well, I think we'll take one more question as we are about 30 minutes over. And I thank everyone for participating. And if you have any additional questions, or concerns, please visit our website. We have a lot of information on there, full curriculums, and then also you are able to contact us by phone or email, and we're happy to talk to you in further detail about this program. So the last question we're gonna take right now is about, is this certification accredited by what institution or organization in the world, like example, CFA? Okay, so this is not an accredited program. I mean, accredited programs are more, you know, for college level or professional accreditation like the CFA. So this is not an accredited program, no. However, us being New York Institute of Finance, it's accredited by us and we are recognized by uh, the New York State of Education and also um, NASBA as well. So we do develop all of our curriculums in a way that meets certain standards, especially for online and virtual training. So that said, I'd like to thank everyone. I'd like to thank our presenters, Jimmy Pang, Chris Thomas. Thank you so much for an engaging and well done presentation. And Jack, thank you so much for answering all of our questions and walking us through the curriculum. I think that this is a really exciting thing, especially during summer when you know you want to learn something new. This is you know a really cool program for people to check out. So I hope that you come and give us a call and we'll go ahead and conclude with that. So thank you.